1967, Detroit was hit by a riot. We didn't realize how angry people were. Now all these police, every time you see one of them, he's gonna stop a brother, he don't never stop no white. That's why we out here riding. Are you considering uh, establishing martial law? To be really just in the middle of utter lawlessness. I thought we was at war. I just pray for everybody. What happened in 67 changed Detroit forever. This is a 7 Action News special, Detroit 1967, looking back to look forward. Tonight we are marking an anniversary that forever changed Detroit. It has been 50 years since July 23rd, 1967, the day violent unrest erupted in our city. It continued for nearly a week, leaving areas of the city burned and all who live there scarred. Long after the flames were extinguished, the work began to figure out what happened and to make sure the root causes of the rebellion were addressed. We spent the past three months looking back to look forward into the future and the next chapters for Detroit. Now we have the privilege of telling the remarkable stories of Detroiters who lived through the 67 riots. One such person who went through it firsthand happens to be one of my childhood priests in the city of Detroit. The image of violence are still burned in his memory, but tonight there is reason to hold on to hope. One has a roadmap for life in the priesthood, and certainly there's no class and no words of wisdom in the seminary that could prepare a young Donald Archambault for a life of service in Detroit. Three other seminarians and myself decided we wanted to live in the black community to understand the culture better. Behind the walls of Sacred Heart Seminary, future men of the cloth used to be isolated from the predominantly African-American community right outside their windows. But that all changed on July 23rd of 1967. Five days of what some described as a race war in the heart of Detroit. Father Don was living with a black family near Mack and Fairview. While watching the news one night, the owner of that house threw Father Don to the ground. Well, what's going on, Leon? He says, don't you see those, those sparks going through the, the porch? I said, those are tracer bullets. The National Guard had been ch chasing uh, one of the looters down the alley, firing over our house, and it was coming through the porch. Father Don says the unrest was all around them. We had put really the family that we were staying with in great danger because there was a radical living in the apartments down at the end of the street who didn't like whites staying in the neighborhood. The racial divide had been brewing for years. And there was always this rumor that things were bubbling up, that there was frustration and rage in, in the community. Father Don says while whites could leave and relocate, blacks often found redlining would keep them out of certain neighborhoods. But at that point, I came to understand the struggle of being African-American. Despite bullets whizzing overhead, Father Don was not fearful, and he had an underlying resolve that would not allow him to cut and run. The experience of the riot and the rebellion of that day really, really refocused my ministry in my life. Among the poor and middle classes where Father Don has made his mark, but he insists without good jobs, better education, and affordable housing for all, the sins of the past could haunt us once again. And until we secure that for all citizens, no matter where we live, we stand a chance of things repeating themselves. As Catholic churches and schools have closed in droves in the city, Father Don has been steadily growing his fourth parish, Corpus Christi Catholic Church, from 300 to now 700 families. So you don't feel a racial divide at all in this community? Uh, no, I don't really. Well, of course, the neighborhood is almost 90%, 95% black. The church shows a mixture of peoples from 15 different countries. And what they're doing is moving forward. This past year, over 65,000 hours of volunteer work was done. On the right path for a better tomorrow. Father Don says we have to find a way to appreciate the blue collar everyday worker. Yeah, he says we have to be very careful how we treat all people so history like the 67 riots will never be repeated. And whatever you call what happened back then, a riot or a rebellion, depends largely on your individual perspective. But we all know the painful consequences of the violence for the city, its people, and property. 
Longtime Channel 7 anchor Eric Smith shows us what it was like to be on the ground reporting during those horrific days that is still to come. Yeah. Let's talk about the numbers. We'll get to Eric, but uh, some of the numbers associated with uh, the riots, the impact on people and property here. Take a look. Those five violent days in July of 1967 scarred the city's landscape and came at a tremendous cost. When looking back at the riot's destructive impact, one must begin with the human toll. 43 dead, it's tragic. Lots of different types of people among that 43. The majority of those who died were black. Injury counts vary. The official number was said to be 657. Hospitals reported treating nearly 1,200 people. Injuries suffered by the police and military totaled 467. One section of the exhibit, Detroit 67 Perspectives, at the Detroit Historical Museum focuses on the numbers associated with the rebellion. Those figures include the response from police and fire locally, as well as the role the federal government played in trying to quell the violence. We're talking seven, 8,000 National Guard, 4,500 uh, airborne troops, uh, Michigan State policemen, regular policemen, Fire departments from all over the area came in to help out. Joel Stone is the Detroit Historical Society's senior curator and author of Detroit 1967. More than 7,200 people were arrested. Homes and businesses in the hundreds were destroyed, with four times that many damaged. Just over 2,500 businesses were affected, and it had a devastating impact for many, according to Stone. It was thousands of people who were, you know, went to those jobs every day and they woke up one day and those jobs were gone. The great majority of those small businesses never rebuilt. Only 10% of it was completely insured. Uh, most people carried partial insurance, half the people carried no insurance at all. And once they lost it, it was just gone. In all, the financial losses tied to the riots totaled $145 million. The insurance reimbursement covered only 32 million. The raid of a blind pig on 12th Street proved to be the linchpin for the uprising, but police brutality is cited most often as the primary root cause of the violence. When the Detroit Police Department in 1967 had nearly 4,300 uh, personnel, only 200 of them were African American. Uh, and that's in a city that was about 43% African American. Those numbers are significantly different now. 2,434 people now work for DPD, and department figures provided to Action News show the workforce is 58% black. And still to come on our Detroit 2020 special, a uh, longtime Channel 7 anchor Eric Smith shows us what it was like to be on the ground reporting during those horrific days. And the music never stopped. Things did change in Detroit and at Motown before and certainly after the 1967 riots. We'll focus on the impact on the arts as we look back to look forward 50 years later, just ahead.
Motown was still cranking out the hits in 1967. But five years after the riots, founder Barry Gordy made the difficult decision to move the music west to Los Angeles. <laughs> For Temptations fans an unmistakable beginning to a classic song. The opening notes and chords from guitarist Dennis Coffey on Just My Imagination was one of his many contributions as a member of the Funk Brothers. The rhythm section backs so many of Motown's monster hits of the 1960s and early 70s. I look at the Funk Brothers as the best studio band in the world, uh, and you can judge that by the amount of hit records that we did. And we usually did three songs every three hours and made them hit records. Not surprisingly, Dennis Coffey was inside a recording studio on Detroit's west side in July of 1967 as the city started burning. We got one of our guys to go stand outside the studio and watch the flames while we finished the session, hoping that they weren't moving that fast and we could get done. So the guy's watching the flames and it was creeping up and creeping up and we got our tapes, finished the session and we got out of there. Now 76, Dennis Coffey has never stopped working and performing in Detroit. Things have changed, but now they're changing back the other way. Uh, did that event create that and may have, but uh, that is uh, such a complex issue, I don't think it's a simple answer. Ken Coleman is a historian who chronicles black life in Detroit. And this is uh, Hitsville, USA, is only about a half mile away from the epicenter of the 67 Rebellion, 12th Street and Claremont. We met outside the Motown Museum to discuss the impact of the rebellion on the arts in Detroit and specifically music, which was an important part of the curriculum in the Detroit public schools throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s. You can talk about the, a number of Motown artists that, that grew up in Detroit, attended Detroit public schools, and got a chance to play an instrument or to, to sing uh, in a vocal choir. Uh, those programs, again, were robust. Diana Ross at Cass and Smokey Robinson and uh, Aretha Franklin at Northern. All types of artists come out of Northwestern High School. They grew up in this neighborhood. The neighborhood changed after the riots, and so too did some of the music coming out of Motown. At 67, Rebellion, I think, influenced people like Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder and others uh, to write music that might at the time been called protest music, but it was a response to the environment um, that had, that really had uh, its foot on their neck for many years. Wow, amazing to look back. A veteran Channel 7 News anchor found himself at the center of the riots while he was reporting. We'll share Eric Smith's eye-opening recollection of 1967 and his reflection of how Detroit is moving forward coming up next.
looking back to look forward. Throughout 1967, 159 race riots broke out across the U.S. in 128 cities. Detroit's was the largest. And what our colleagues did to cover the five days of rebellion here 50 years ago was all captured in the Detroit Free Press documentary film, 12th and Claremont. I went back to where the riots took place with my friend and Channel 7 legend Eric Smith, who covered the riots from start to finish. It was just crazy. It, 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 I, can't, I, I can't make it real for anybody who wasn't there. It was a dark moment in Detroit's history. Five days Eric would like to erase from his memory. If you can imagine hell on Grand River Avenue, that's what it was. For Eric, this was personal. I was in the thick of it here on Grand River. And not just another news story. He grew up in the city, not too far from where the rioting broke out. This is a war in my city. This is not, not just your city, but your neighborhood. I didn't realize you lived here, and I yeah. didn't realize you were shopping oh. in these businesses oh, right yeah. here. You know, we, I, I grew up, I went to school down by Northwestern, you know. There are a lot of names for what happened here. Civil unrest, you know, race riot. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. That's the last thing in the world it was. In my heart, it was a rebellion. Reporters had to wear helmets and flak jackets, but Eric's outer armor could not shield his eyes from seeing death. I saw a little boy uh, who was looting a, a department store, shot, um, carrying away a little black and white TV. Come on, you know, uh, how do you get to that? He and his Channel 7 photographer, Mike Kalouche, captured this woman driving with a pistol in hand behind the wheel. The street was just alive with people. Today, as we walk around, Eric is saddened by seeing what has not been fixed in the five decades that have now passed. This used to be, I, as I recall, Richmond Brothers clothing store. A shuttered clothing store where Eric once shopped and a former movie theater right on Grand River. This corner is where Eric was attacked during the riots when the crowd mistakenly thought he was a cop. After the riots, Eric says promises of rebuilding were made, but... All of a sudden, after that riot, things changed. White flight was enormous. It, it drained the city of, of financial resources, tax base. The blight on street after street. We've had 50 years. We've had 50 years. Yeah. And... and this is the disappointment I feel in my heart. While disheartening to see the destruction, there are signs of growth. We've come a long way, but boy, the road uh, is still long, long, long. But who knows, maybe we'll get there. You know? I hope. I've got my fingers crossed. We have our fingers crossed, too. We all hope so, mm -hmm. absolutely. Long road, as you say. One of Detroit's former top cops recalls the night he became a victim. How the Detroit riot shaped him into the man he is today. That is just ahead. Looking back to look forward, the Detroit Fire Department responded to 3,034 calls during the week of unrest in 1967. You will find people point to different reasons for the uprising or the rebellion. Uh, but the one mentioned most is the way Detroit police treated minorities living in the city. And the man who had a front row seat to it all is former Detroit police chief Ike McKinnon. Walk into Isaiah Ike McKinnon's office at the University of Detroit Mercy and you will see how this decorated former Detroit police chief, professor, author, and proud grandpa has lived his life. The baseball field used to be over there. But the echoes from growing up in this city, once plagued by abuse from police, continue to replay in his mind. It was a car called the Big Four. There were four very large white officers who would jump out of the car. They would jump out with their machine gun and uh, rifle and throw these young men up against the car and uh, they would beat them up. These horrifying memories have been written about and shared in the Detroit Free Press documentary film, 12th and Claremont. But these stories became real when I listened to McKinnon recall his experience. The big four grabbed me, threw me up against the car, 
and the name calling and proceeded to beat me up. That did something to you, though. That stirred <laughs> something in your soul, right? That evening, I made a decision I was going to become a Detroit police officer. At 22, Ike became a DPD officer. There are officers who quit the department rather than have the, the scout cars integrated. Now all these police, every time you see one of them, he gonna stop a brother, he don't never stop no way. That's why we out here riding, and we gonna keep on riding. After only two years on the force, Detroiters' anger would boil over and erupt into the 1967 rebellion. Our thoughts were that, well, it wouldn't happen here in Detroit. But the reality is that we didn't realize how angry people were. With rioting where he lived, Ike came here to his parents' home in his old neighborhood for safe refuge. Ike served four years in the Air Force, but seeing tanks roaring up and down the streets of Detroit brought about a different fear. I started seeing uh, uh, officers uh, and, and uh, National Guards people shoot, you know, indiscriminately uh, at houses. But guns were not just aimed at homes. Ike found a weapon drawn on him by a fellow officer during the rioting. They said, get out of the car, and they used the racially derogatory term. And I said, police, and they said, you're gonna die tonight. Still, Ike refused to quit the force as so many did. I had to stay because I was not gonna give in. I was not going to be uh, a victim of my anger. But for many, that anger still quietly simmers. We have to continue to give people, whether they are the poorest of people, or the riches of people hope. And most important, learn from our mistakes so the echoes of the past will be forever silenced. We tend to forget, or sometimes people want us to forget. We can't forget what happened. You can't forget and you have to give people hope. And how important for this city that Ike McKinnon has been there to serve all these years. And continues and to continues serve. And continues to yeah. serve. We're back in a moment. Looking back to look forward, in 1967, Detroit had 1.5 million residents, making it the country's fifth largest city. Certainly hard to believe where we are today. We thank you so much for joining us tonight for this journey back in history. I truly learned a lot about the history of the city I grew up in, the pain from the past and a way forward to the future, and I believe it certainly looks bright. And if you did not get a chance tonight here on Channel 7 to see the documentary film 12th and Claremont, there'll be a free screening Thursday. This is at uh, Campus Marshes Park. It'll begin 
at 8 o'clock, so hopefully you'll have a chance then. And I think throughout this, this hasn't been a celebration of this 50th anniversary of the Detroit riots. It's an acknowledgement, it's a commemoration of a very, very historic time in our city, and it's one that we need to continue to learn from. Certainly a reflection. Be sure to let us know what you think about the documentary film on our website, Facebook page, and Twitter. Have a great night.